This podcast is brought to you by Trivelo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. I'm your host, Jordan Donnelly, and on my left is former Australian Ironman champion and head coach of Trivelo Coaching, Jared Donnelly. In today's podcast episode, we have former AFL footballer, Nathan Jones. Now, for those uh, who are international listeners, uh, AFL is Australian rules football. It's the biggest sport here in Australia. And Nathan uh, played at the highest level for 16 years. He played for the Melbourne Football Club. He played 302 professional games and was the captain of the club from 2014 to 2019, which is a really prestigious honor. He was three times best and fairest or most valuable player for the club. Uh, three years in a row, and he will go down as uh, one of the all-time legends of the Melbourne Football Club. He was a leader through one of their toughest uh, decades in the club's history, and that's a really important part of this story is that uh, Melbourne, uh, the club he played for, really had a tumultuous um, 10, 12, 14 years where they were at the bottom of the ladder, and for a club that's so uh, got such rich history behind it, it was one of the darkest periods in their um, lengthy history as a club, and uh, he was right in the center of it through that whole period. And uh, anyone that talks about Nathan Jones as a footballer knows that he was kind of the center rock that was, um, he was their best player for a long time. He was their captain. Um, and each week he had to front up when they were losing uh, most games of the year for a long time. And it was hard for the fans, hard for the club. They, they churned through coaches um, and got to the end of his career and suffered a little bit more heartbreak when uh, they won the premiership last year after so much, uh, so many years of hardship and uh, he missed out on the actual grand final. And that's not the story we want to paint of Nathan today because that's not the focus. And uh, anyone that uh, looks at his AFL career doesn't think of him that way. Uh, they think of him as an absolute legend of the game, a legend of the club and uh, very much a rock for that actual premiership winning team. Um, and you'll hear that part of him uh, in today's episode, which is just so inspiring and uh, he really opens up about his story and his transition from his professional career to triathlon. And that's where we come in. He, he finished uh, his footy career and needed something to do. And he uh, contacted Trivello and contacted you, Dad, to start helping him and said, I'm doing a 70.3 in, in just over 12 weeks' time. Can you help me? And uh, what unraveled was a pretty fun story. And he just debuted in his 70.3 yesterday. And so in today's episode, we ask him all about it. Um, and yeah, he, he dives into his whole triathlon career, how it compares to his footy career uh, and everything in between. And it was a really fun, enjoyable episode. I won't spoil the story, but the one thing I take away from it is the, the mental strength that Nathan Jones has, his ability, ability to understand his strengths and weaknesses and his capacity to go through hardship, but still have a smile on his face and be an unbelievably good human being um, around when people are probably losing their mind um, and, and that showed in his race. Um, there were ups and downs just like in his career as a footballer and he had to battle through through some demons during the race yesterday um, and it's, it's a, a great lesson that I want everybody to hear that, you know, even the very, very best people um, at the top of their sport have periods that are uncomfortable um, and you have to work your way through it and, and the one thing he does get across to us is you are more capable in your mind than you think you are. Physically, you can be ruined but you've still got a little bit more to give if you just train your mind to allow you to reach that next capacity. And I think that is the story of Nathan Jones. And I was really proud to be his coach for this period, even though it was the shortest preparation on record. <laughs> um, but I, I just I just think his ability to understand what his journey was about and where he was going. We can't wait for you to hear this one. So without further ado, here is Nathan Jones. Nathan Jones, welcome to the Trivello Coaching Podcast. First question. Normally, we have a certain question. I'm going to ask that second. But first, we just asked you off air, how are you feeling after your big debut 70.3 yesterday? <laughs> uh, I don't reckon I've had like soreness like it ever. <laughs> um, like I've been beaten up playing footy and like, you know, just a general. When With footy, I'd normally got like a bit of hammy doms and maybe some calf stuff, but Mate, I can't even feel my legs right now. Like I was saying before off air, I was like, I got home in the afternoon yesterday and all of our living is upstairs. I literally like on all fours crawled to the top <laughs> and got to the couch and just like laid down. <laughs> I was completely spent. But And I'm paying for it today because obviously with footy, normally it was two days later. So 
today at work getting in and out of the chair i was like oh man i'm sore and i feel like it's getting worse by like it's what now five o'clock and i'm like i think i'm in for another 24 hours of pain before i see the other side of this so anyway good times (laughs) So you've had a ridiculously established career in footy and you've transitioned straight into triathlon. We would normally ask a guest, uh, what does their chosen sport mean to, to them? But I want to ask you, what does sport overall mean to you? Um, oh, for me, it's like a way of life. Like um, it's all I've ever really known, to be honest. Like I've, I've competed at a relatively high level since maybe like if I go all the way back to when I was 11, 12, as far as like, state and national school titles is in like swimming cross country athletics and then football i pretty much did that every year almost until i got drafted so i always had this like and obviously in those younger years was you know summer sport for me was always like running swimming and at at one point i combined that with triathlons probably for two three years And then I didn't really commit properly to footy. So I've always been in this like cycle of routine, like with a challenge or a goal in mind and like the consistency of training and just like, that's what I've lived and breathed my whole life. And, um, and then obviously, you know, playing in the AFL for 16 years, that was my professional career. Like my day to day life was that like live and breathe preparing, trying to be the best, looking into like every little minute detail, nutrition, Mm. um, you know, preparation, recovery, strength, everything. Like it was just all dialed down. That's I lived and breathed that. That was, that's pretty much what it was. And then you just played on the weekends. That's uh, And I was real conscious. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, you go. Sorry, Nate. Sorry. Yeah. I was just real conscious as I came towards the end of my career, like, I was, I was worried about what would happen when that is done. Um, and I knew uh, in my own mind I had to find find something else. Um, and that's – it was always – I think it was inevitable that I would come back to trials because I felt like it was uh, something I never really uh, got to sort of experience every last bit of it before I committed to playing footy back when I was sort of 16. That's a really good uh, summary of your career because uh, to, just to give the listeners a little bit of a guide, one of our, our very very best closest friends that I went through uni with li- happened to live next door to you. And yeah. um, and I, I would take uh, Jordan and Liam and Matt and Georgia down to visit the friends and invariably the the Joneses next door would have a match of, you know, a footy match on the local oval. (laughs) And uh, so we got a first glimpse of your, um, I don't know, your competitiveness, um, almost your brutality as an (laughs) (laughs) 11-year-old. I hated yeah. it because you guys were so, <laughs> you were, you were so rough. It was the roughest games I'd ever played. <laughs> uh, that was good times though. That was, uh, that, they're some of the best memories I had, like um, just to paint the pictures, like we lived in this court and obviously I'm, I'm one of three boys and then the neighbours you speak of had three boys and then the neighbours next to them had two boys and we backed on to a primary school. And so it was like when you guys would come and visit or like other friends would come and visit, it was like we could almost have like, five on five cricket games and five on five footy games. It was just like, well, that's what we just lived and breathed day to day. If, it was, if we weren't playing team sport, it was like every afternoon we'd just be out there playing some form of sport in some capacity. It was always, it always got pretty competitive, but yeah, they're some of the best memories I had of, of when I was a kid. And, you know, as you mentioned uh, before, you know, you were always representing, you know, your school, then your then your uh, district, and then your state at cross country, at swimming, and you know competing at national level as an 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way through school, you were at the the pinnacle end of. And it's no wonder you could have you know probably chosen any sport to be reasonably good at because that's the competitive nature. Which which is an intriguing question. The next one I want to ask you is <laughs> why did you think at the, um, you have obviously thought your career is coming to an end as an AFL professional footballer. What was going through your mind? Were, were you ticking off sports going, what, what can I, was it golf? What can I do bloody lawn bowls or what, <laughs> what did half Ironman, how did that jump into your brain? Yeah, there's a few things in my, like I have like this bucket list of like, and everyone does of things they want to do, like traveling. And there's an element of extremism there. Like I would love to do skydiving. I've done bungee jumping, like, you know, um, heli snowboarding, all those kind of things. 
And the, the physical side of things is like, I'd love to tick a marathon off. I'd love to do a half Ironman. I'd love to do an Ironman. And obviously that connection with triathlon. And you add to the fact that my hobbies outside of footy are surfing and golf, which take up probably, what, five hours every time I want to do it. Um, I just figured that, you know, in the interim, I've, I, we just had twins. So I've got four kids now. Um, and I was going to, I was taking sort of, um, well, I, I pretty much had six months off from the time that I, I finished footy. And I knew in that period, obviously I was adjusting to one life after footy and two, uh, the additions, new additions to the family. Um, I really needed to find some structure. Like, um, everyone sort of, well, if you follow the footy would know that I missed out on us winning the premiership. So, I, you know, there was an emotional element to that. Um, and, you know, obviously publicly I was, you know, very positive and I am very positive about how that ended up for Melbourne, obviously winning the flag and, you know, my involvement there and my role in that. And, you know, I'm proud of that, but still there's the emotional side to the fact that, that I wasn't a part of it. And that's what I'd pretty much trained my whole career for. Um, so I knew that I really quickly needed to move on. Like I, I'm, I was proud of my footy career, but that was sort of just one chapter in my life. And I needed to start a new chapter, like with my family and, and an element of that for me was like setting a new goal and like, um, and with the disappointment that came from an individual point of view at the end of my footy career, I was like, I want to set something where I sort of iterate that when you set your mind to it and you commit to something that you can achieve it kind of thing. And that would be like a sort of propel me into the next phase of life. And hence I got to the point where I was like, I'm going to go for something that's half out there. I couldn't commit to a full Ironman because I just didn't have the time, but, um, you know, I felt like a half was achievable. And as you know, Jerry, I did it in a small amount of time. I committed in December and we raced yesterday. So, and I was pretty happy with the result. Well, what were your expectations? Cause you're not new to the sport of triathlon, as you said, but, uh, you definitely hadn't experienced anything like a half Ironman before. So what were your expectations right back 12, 13 weeks ago when you made that decision? How yeah. hard did you think it was going to be? I think I recorded that uh, that interview <laughs> with uh, with Nathan, and some of the answers uh, I was getting back well, twelve weeks ago were sure. going to be different to what he's going to say right now. I reckon. Well, we had yeah, we had a, a very interesting conversation. It was uh, it was pretty awesome, really, because obviously there was that connection that we spoke of before, and a few people and a, a crew at Giant that, that that have helped me out for most of my career with bikes and stuff also recommended Jerry. And then there was the connection with my wife's um, family, knowing Jerry and you guys and your, the Donnelly family. And then obviously uh, the neighbors when I was kids. So there was like this three way connection. I was like, this is inevitable. I've got to go with Jerry. He's got to help me, you know, um, achieve this goal. And I, and that was funnily enough, right? This is the reason why I um, seeked out a coach was I started to prepare for the um, marathon. I was like, I'll do the Melbourne marathon. And I trained for three or four weeks and I was flying, like running as quick as I ever have stripped down a bit. And then all of a sudden I just hit a wall and I was like running and I just couldn't run any faster. Like actually it was going backwards. I felt worse. And then hence we had a conversation and I, I abandoned the plan to commit to that. And I committed to the Ironman. (laughs) Um, and I explained that story and and hence I went on a journey with Jerry where he educated me on a very different mentality comparative to what I'd trained myself for for you know 16 years in the AFL, which is you know it's a high intensity sport where you um, you know a lot of it is sort of anaerobic burst, repeat effort, repeat speed kind of training, whereas this is completely different with you know, a lot of it or most of it, if not all of it is endurance. And, you know, there's a huge factor of letting your ego go and um, pacing and power management and all these kind of things, which I have learned. It's been an amazing, it's like a, a university degree in triathlons in 12 weeks. I, uh, one of the text messages you sent me through the, through the, about the 12 week program was, I just thought you had to ride your bike. It's like I've never ridden a bike before. The shit you're telling me that I need to do. Uh, yeah, well, that's like um, – so funnily enough, I didn't have a time trial bike. Um, so I raced um, – I had my road bike, which I've had for my footy career. I used to ride in off-season stuff because I just loved it so much. And I raced the first 2XU, like, warm-up race on my road bike, and I realized I was like, holy shit, these guys on time trial bikes, like, I can't ride any faster – and they just fly past you like they're not trying. So that was my first intro to it. 
And then I only ended up being able to get onto my time trial about six weeks before the race. So that was literally like the biggest learning curve of the entire thing was literally, I, I, I'm just being honest, like it actually felt like I had to learn to ride a bike again. Like you get on there and think you just pedal. and But this whole um, understanding of like keeping your power in that sort of um, – zone three, four range, not one, two or five, six and, and like spiking power and, you know, just controlling all that and using your gears and cadence and all this stuff. I'd like, it's not stuff that I'd never even thought of, like, but it all makes sense to me. And the better I got at it, I understood, you know, you, you controlling your heart rate and your energy exerted, which will help with the run and all these kind of things. So but yeah, it was it was tough because it's like I understood what Joey was saying, but then it was a lot harder to put it into practice because it was like um, some days I'd do real good, but then I'd have a huge amount in zone one, two, and then I'd be like, oh, I'll fix that next time. But then I'd have a huge amount in zone five, six, and I was like, I can't bloody get this. This is like – but um, nah, I'm glad we went through that process because it saved me on the weekend, that's for sure. <laughs> Look, and one of the things that uh, for those listening, we bang on about, you know, practicing uh, your event in the zones and on the, you know, using the equipment you're going to race on. And, and you know, for you to have a, such a short 12-week period of training for a 70.3 when you've, you've, done, you've done basically no triathlon training since you were 16. <laughs> so yeah, so we're, asking, we're asking a lot about, about you as a human to be able you to – come from a great base, but yeah. Yeah, and look, you were, <laughs> you, you were pretty fit as a, as a runner, uh, as a football runner, but you also had done a, a small amount of running preparing for the marathon, even though it was not exactly what you should have been doing, but you actually got yourself to a good level. Yeah, it was, it was detrimental. Though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the funny thing is uh, you took to the, to the TT bike like you, know, like you should have and, and your willingness, and this is what people need to understand, you, you did, you know, as I say to people when they go to a race, leave your ego in the car and, and start riding like a mature or racing like a mature adult. And you did exactly that. You, you didn't ex- express to me that you knew everything. You were doing the opposite. Just tell me, Jared, what I have to do and I'll do it. And that, that is why you got yourself to the start line in such great shape because you you had the same attitude as you has had as a professional footballer. You applied that to to your career as a your twelve week career as a as a triathlete, and <laughs> and it was a pleasure to actually have someone who is just going to listen and implement all the instructions, even if they sounded like what the hell is he on about? <laughs> um, but you understood it eventually by trial and error that you know that does make sense. And do you think that was a do you think that was a turning point for you once you got on the tt bike and then realized shit i can actually i can actually do these these numbers and i can ride the speed that and i remember when we did the first 2xu race and you're on your road bike and ironically you would not have scripted this any better but as i was coming past you were coming out of transition and you just looked at me and went how the are you doing that (laughs) i still remember you look you look back at me i was like what what is going on here (laughs) Um, and I, that was like that for the whole race, that whole 25 K in the sprint race. I was just like, these guys are just flying past. And I was like, if I'm being serious about this, I need to learn like what's going on. So I think that ego out the door stuff, like I learned that pretty late in my career, like with footy, um, that thing happened overnight, I think, but ultimately I started to get better results throughout my career when I took that. Um, that path, you know, I adopted that mentality of like just seeking out whatever I could. And that's what helped me through my footy career was like just letting the ego go and just whoever was a professional or elite in their field, just listen to them. And if they've got something that is worthwhile taking hold of, you know, take that little bit and add it to your sort of recipe. And obviously coming to triathlon with no experience in a long time and only ever raced when I was younger in sprint races, which essentially I could just have an all out crack and be done with it. Whereas I was attempting a half Ironman, which as I learned, and I learned, I had some days where I thought, Oh no, I'll, like I didn't say this to you, but I'd be like, Oh no, I'll ride, I'll ride faster than that. Or I'll run quicker than that. And I, I cost myself. I still remember I called my wife a couple of times, like, I'm stuck on beach road and I can't run anymore. Can you please come pick me up? Um, 
And she found me like sitting on the edge of the road. And I was just <laughs> absolutely spent. But then I, I was just like, and through those learning experiences, like obviously it, it's where you're like, you know what? Like he's right. I need to just keep trying to do what you, what you said. And it was funny. Like the more I followed the program, the better I got. And even though I didn't feel like I was seeing like amazing improvement, then I finally freshened up. And I, my, I had a goal. I remember when I told you with my um, road bike, I was like, I want to ride at 40K an hour. And every single practice ride I did, I didn't get close to averaging 40K an hour. Like, I was like, I'm never going to get there. It's going to take me years. And then on the weekend, funnily enough, I think my average was like 39.8 or 39. Mm. Yeah. So I practically rode that quick off six weeks of practice on a TT bike, just following the program to a like jet, particularly the riding stuff I followed to an absolute T because I just was coming so far back from a skill set. Like uh, it really stripped me back to being like, <laughs> like I said, I felt like I had to learn to ride a bike again. And, and that trusting the process, that, that, that takes a lot of maturity. Um, and that was the impressive thing. And for everybody out there, you, you just have to, if you believe in who's guiding you, it doesn't matter who your coach is, you've got to trust the process and give it a chance. And, and if it works out that that's, you know, you've experienced that with football coaches, you've had some shockers, you've had some brilliant ones. And, yeah. But no matter how good or bad they are, you still need to trust them, give them a chance. And, Absolutely. And then you can decide, well, this isn't working. And, you know, you, you would have had experiences that over the years with, as your career unfolded that there was some, you know, disappointing things periods that uh you trust the process but all of a sudden people then stop trusting the process because it's not working um yeah for sure but the the, the question i'm, I'm going to ask is is so looking back now um is there is there anything that that you you think that you you should have done better in that period or you think you think your preparation was was as good even though we only had 12 weeks and and, you know, I, when I first introduced you to the program and we had to fast track you and it was, we have to do a base training program in four weeks and yeah, that's yeah. normally, you know, 12 weeks or eight weeks yeah. for someone. Um, and I'm saying and explaining to you, you have to get in those heels and you have to just do it and yeah, yeah. and by yourself. And you, you got out of bed at, you know, Sparrow's fart and, and rode <laughs> to the Danny Nongs in the rain and, and by yourself and four hours later, you, you achieved the goal and, you know, is, yeah, anything that you think about looking back on that period that you're thinking, oh, God, I don't know about this. Oh, no, like from a program point of view, I actually felt a real sense of relief. Like when we finally got going and I was getting like my update, like that for me was like any sort of anxiousness about where, what direction my life was going in. Um, I felt a sense of calm because I like at least I had that routine, which is exactly what I was looking for. Like. Um, because I had a whole heap of change going on with kids and new career. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Am I going to take a year off? I just didn't want mm. to be floating around. And when I finally got that, I felt I've got my purpose. You know what I mean? I'm, 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 aim I'm aiming f towards something. That's my challenge. I think the hard thing to adjust for me was like that I wasn't professional anymore. So if I had my time again, I don't know how it fitted in, but I'd love to spend more time recovering, more time um, probably on, from a nutritional point of view, more time from a hydration point of view. But it was just like I would need to be more prepared with that and I sort of ran out of time just on the day-to-day -day with family and that kind of thing. So um, I'm not saying that I didn't do that to do, do that well because I'm just generally pretty good at that anyway. But if I was being really specific about it, like comparative to what I was like with my footy, I would just have put more time into that, which ultimately, you know, would help from a recovery point of view and output would be better and those kind of things. Sleep would be better. Like obviously, I did it off the back of not having a lot of uh, mm. quality sleep and all those kind of things. Like, But in saying that, after I've been with my wife my whole footy career and she was like, I thought you'd finish being a professional athlete and then all of a sudden I'm up at five in the morning going riding and I'm running and I'm like, I'm going to race an Ironman. man. She's like, Oh my God, I thought we were done with this life of like, just, so I couldn't really convince her that I was going to be like not helping with the babies during the night. Cause I'm getting up to ride in the morning. So I just had to commit to it and make it work in the best possible way. So I think that was probably the most difficult thing out of it was just realizing that, Hey, I'm not like, this is not, 
I'm not making a living out of this. This is just a genuine you know, interest and passion mm-hmm. for me. So I'm just going to give it my best shot with whatever comes at me. And I just had to get used to, you know, if the babies woke up, they woke up, you know, if I didn't feel great or, you know, I wasn't feeling like today was the day, like I just have to make some adjustments. Whereas like with footy, it was never like that. You know, my whole life would be put on hold because that was, that was my livelihood. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I, that's what probably makes it even more, makes me feel even more proud about the achievement is the fact that you, you do it for that reason that it is not to say that when I played footy, it wasn't for passion, but like it was just, there was much higher stakes and obviously getting paid for it and all these kind of things. It's like, that's like my day-to-day job 24 seven. Whereas there's a whole heap of other things. And this is just something I want to do for my own personal joy and, you know, challenge. Um, and in the end, it was probably more rewarding for the fact that I, I didn't let it take over my life, but I still found a way to fit it in because I wanted to. And it sort of, um, proves to or prove to me that I used to always shake my head at like guys that would do Ironman training and they'd have full-time jobs and families. Mm-hmm. I'm like, how the hell do you fit that in? But like, if you're passionate enough about it, you just find a way. Like I remember those times when like, I funnily enough started a new job and I've done some stuff in the media recently, which has chewed up even more of my free time. Um, like I was getting up at four 30 in the morning to ride time trials like the you know, 90k efforts and the 240k efforts and stuff before work. Um, but that's just because I loved it. And I actually grew to love the fact that I love getting up at that early in the morning. And then it's so many like-minded people you see at that time in the mm-hmm. morning. I'm like, what is this world? I've never even seen this before. But like, there's so many crew out on beach road, like running and on time trial bikes. And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I think that's one thing I've loved about the triathlon community is like, and I said this in an interview after the race yesterday, like, the morale and community sense as much as it's an individual sport, like, like dealing with the Trivalo guys and all the crew you see on race day, like I don't know anyone very well, but like you're all part of like that family and that team. And, and, um, and as much as you're all racing in an individual sport, like you cross paths with everyone, there's high fives, encouragement. Like I remember Tom, Tom um, Page riding past yesterday, giving me encouragement. And then every time we passed each other on the run yesterday, like a high five, keep going. And, and there's a few other Trivalo guys. I wouldn't even know their names, I don't reckon. But the same thing, like you see them and you just give them a tap on the back. And I just loved that sort of vibe. It was such a cool vibe out there yesterday. And it's been like that in the other local races with the 2XU series. And um, yeah, it's just, a, it's been a really cool community to sort of invest my time into since finish. Tell, tell us a bit about, uh, you've been in a team sport your whole life and had to rely on others around you. And you know, no matter how good a game you played, if the team lost, it still didn't feel satisfying, did it? What, no. was it like, what was it like when you're in charge of your own destiny? Tell us a little bit about the difference you felt. Oh, that, I think that's the thing that motivated me the most, really. And that's what I sort of alluded to before when I was mentioning, like, I wanted to find something that rebuilt my confidence in myself again. Um, and that's not to say that I finished my career like all sad, doom and gloom. Like I was proud of everything that I achieved and I was wrapped for the footy club and stuff. But ultimately, I didn't win the premiership, which I'd pretty much for my whole life as a kid and then 16 years of my career, that's all I wanted. And I missed out, pretty much missed out on the last game of my career. Like I'd been in emergency mm-hmm. in the four or five games leading up to it. So, And then I sort of had to make the decision to get home because my wife was going to give birth to the twins. So it sort of was just a... Wrong place, mm. wrong time, and the crossing mm. of the paths. I had so much joy happen at home, but ultimately from a professional sense, I missed out. And so for me, it was like I need a challenge to like rebuild that sort of inner belief in myself. Like I don't know where my life's going at the moment. I don't know what the next career choice is. I've got new kids. I just I want to go and do something where I just have to rely on me. And I, if I really want to do it, I have to put the work in. I have to commit to it. You know, I have to train, I have to schedule, I have to get in a routine and, and I love that. Like that, that kind of um, mentality is like, that's why I think I've been drawn so much back to triathlon. And I loved individual sports when I was a kid as well with athletics and swimming and all these kind of things. Cause I, I just like the fact that you're responsible for your own destiny kind of thing. And I think the reward is it's very gratifying when you 
when you put it, put the work in and you follow the program and you get the support that you need. And then all of a sudden you produce a result, which for me yesterday, I had a goal of racing under 430. And I actually wasn't sure if that was possible because I was like, I've never done this before. 430 seems pretty quick. Um, I hadn't even done like a 90K into a 21.1K run in training. I was like, I don't really know how I'm going to go. But like I said, I just committed once once we agreed and signed up and I was keen to get on board with you coaching me, Jerry. I just followed it as, as well as I could um, from my day-to-day life. And then the sense of achievement when I crossed the line yesterday, it was just like overwhelming. And so many people said that with when you do the longer stuff, like the 70.3 and the Ironman, it's like this – it's an overwhelming sense of personal achievement. And I a hundred percent got that. Like you, I actually, I actually felt like quite emotional. I was just like, wow, I can't believe I actually did that. And I pretty much went 15 minutes quicker than I anticipated really. And, uh, and I still thought, well, maybe I could go a little bit quicker next time. Um, and that's the funny thing because I started this whole thing out just as fun. I was like, oh, I'm just going to race this for fun. Like, I don't really care. And then I raced that first two XU race, and I was like, <laughs> I do. Care. I actually, I do care. <laughs> I was going to say I that was that was a turning point for you. I reckon when you you were training hard and loving it, but you did that first race and you went, "Oh, I'm hooked now." <laughs> yeah, that's a funny thing. So, and then I then pretty much leading up to the two XU, this is how crazy I got. I started looking at like times from Geelong a few weeks ago, and I'm like, well, I wonder if I could do that and I was like trying to check out like what my age group like the winner was and where my numbers sat and then obviously got the excel spreadsheet where you can do the race plan and I was just like uh, I got so hooked onto it like yeah I loved it I loved the whole thing really I want to go through the race uh, but I also want to take it back to that first conversation again and dad you can give your side of this uh when Nathan said what do you think I can do and your (laughs) your your personal goal was 4.30, 4.30, but like you said, you don't even know if that was possible. Dad, how did you approach that part of the conversation? Well, I, like Nathan would say, I kind of laughed um, and and I just said, look, I have no idea anything about you. So you're asking me a question that's got no perspective. I, I just don't know what your running's like. I know you're good for 10 metres flat out and you can knock someone over and tackle <laughs> them and, and break away from the centre bounce, but that's about all I know you can do. And and really, it was the unknown, and that's how everybody comes to me with that question is, what do you think I can do the Ironman in? Do you reckon I can break nine hours? Do you reckon I can break 13 hours? You know, and that's that's even a worse question for an Ironman because it's it's the unknown, and and it all depends on, you know, I kept saying to, to Nathan, it depends, mate. How much time can you put into it? Depends. It, the word is it depends on a whole lot of things, and, you know, can you, can you get some uh, – training in that's going to be very specific without interruptions without inconsistency you're not injured you know these are the things i'm saying there is no ceiling you you have the opportunity to do whatever you like in this next 12 weeks and we'll know and i said you know we've got a trivalo race calculator that you got to play around with and you'll know the week of the race exactly what you're pretty much going to do on race day and guess what you are pretty much within 30 seconds oh, yeah. Um, Pretty much of the original plan, not the plan I told you. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I didn't. I still didn't think that was possible when I put the numbers in. It punched out four sixteen, and I was like, "No way, I can do that. I'm going to be a bit more lenient." And I think I told you in the end four twenty. Um, but I still, even leading up to it, I was, I was like, a few people were like, "What do you reckon you'll do?" And I didn't want to tell them. I'd be like, "Oh, I reckon like maybe four thirty or just a bit under." Because I was like, if I fail at this now, I'll look like the biggest dick. <laughs> so um, I was preferred to just go a bit lower and then overshoot that and look way better anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do they say? Under, under, under oh, what is it? Yeah, what I know the saying. That's yeah. I was going to say, it, but I wasn't quite sure either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But, you, you, you know, you don't want to be uh, – you know, have an egg on your face. And, and look, that was, that's a bit of humility too. So, you know, you've got to really, but the conversation for me was, look, you can achieve whatever you want and we will, we will know the results before the race. And, and that's, that gave you confidence to go, okay, let's just see where the journey takes us. That's kind of how I remember the conversation. And, uh, and I'm never going to commit to a time in week one of a 12 week program. And, you know, that's just madness. 
Let's take it to the race then. So take us through your experience. Uh, how are you feeling, you know, the night before and on race morning? You've been in this situation 302 times at the highest level possible in footy. Uh, how was it compared to preparing for game day? Well, this sort of goes back to the question you asked me before, Jerry. I was like, and this is the difference. But it was like my week could not have been more busy <clears throat> leading into it. <clears throat> um like I mentioned, I started a full-time job only like a month ago. So like I was working nine to five and then <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to get a couple of media opportunities. And I, funnily enough, I had Thursday night footy at the MCG, Friday night footy at Marvel Stadium. And on the Wednesday, Melbourne played and I was involved in the unfilling of the flag. So for three nights in a row, I'd work all day and then was at the footy all night until 10, 30, 11 o'clock. We were shouting at the telly, Nathan, go home. This is the worst preparation. I said to my wife, what's he doing? He needs to be home in bed on Friday night. And here he is, 11 oh. o'clock. He's still in the studio. Oh, yeah. So Saturday came around and I was like, oh, I'm going to try and get some sleep. And then I'll prepare all of my stuff and lay it all out. And then obviously I had to take my bike in to, and do check-in. I, I booked that late in the afternoon to make sure because I knew I'd probably be busy, be busy. And it wasn't until I checked in and got home, packed all my bag for the next morning that I realized like this is actually happening. I started to get a little bit nervous about it. And I was like just cross-checking everything in my mind, which like with footy, I would have already done this in the days before. And I would have rolled up on to, to the pregame training session the day before a game and just being super relaxed but it's like I just didn't have the time to be that organized so that Saturday was the day for me to get organized but also it was the first time I'd really spent any time with the kids and my wife for pretty much four days because I'd been real busy so I juggled that for the day and then I, that night I uh, I was just real conscious the one thing I concentrated on that day was even though my preparation wasn't perfect was just food so for the Friday and the Saturday, I was super conscious on the food that I ate um, and just like I followed a real similar loading program to what I would have done with footy. Um, what was that? Just, can, you, can you go into that specifically? Because that would be really helpful. Yeah. I um, Well, with footy, I used um, – oh, I used to have – I used to use like a carbohydrate supplement uh, called Vitago, but I don't think that's, I don't think you can buy that anymore, but it's anyway, it's like malodextrin or whatever it's called. Um, I'd use that like as an additional like carbohydrate replenishment thing. Cause I hated the feeling of like eating carbs and feeling super bloated. And then just like, I used to, used to eat all white carb stuff. So white rice, main, mainly just ate white rice. Cause I knew it doesn't give me any sort of pain in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Very limited, um, very limited, like a small amount of protein to sort of help with the the balance of um, sort of the macronutrient stuff. Um, and yeah, that's I followed that program in the last couple of years of footy. I got a guy to sort of set me up on a very specific um, like diet, particularly leading into games. Basically, his theory was like only put in what you're going to need, kind of thing. So don't like um, so that, like basically, obviously, because I was loading for the for the race, um, like the base. Essentially, what I what he would tell me to eat is like anything like white carbohydrate stuff, because um, it sort of gets through the system really quickly. Uh, fruit, high sugar, the same sort of carbohydrate content. Um, oats was another thing. So basically for two days, pretty much, I just ate white rice and oats, bananas, berries. Um, and then I used some of that malodextrin stuff with, uh, with like electrolytes for hydration. Um, and that was about it really. I didn't eat anything other than that. And like with the white rice, like a little bit of tamari sauce, like maybe 90 grams of chicken. That's pretty much it. Um, but then I knew I'd get to race day and not have any pains in the stomach. That's the last thing I wanted was mm -hmm. like, I didn't want to have to like go to the toilet during the race. Cause I am like pretty sensitive to that stuff. And that was the same with footy. Like I never wanted to get to the footy on game day and be like, just can't get off the toilet. Cause I've got such a pain in the stomach. So it was just consistency with that. Mm -hmm. And I knew what worked from footy day. So I just followed that pretty much to a T and I probably just tried to boost it up a little bit more, obviously because of the race being for four hours. Um, but yeah. That's all I really, that and hydration were the two things I worried about 
all the way up until once my bag was packed. Then I just tried to calm my nerves by chilling out for a bit and getting into bed early. And that's interesting because the things that you could control, your race plan, you you would because we spoke on the Friday, did we, or the Thursday? Yeah, well, Thursday? so I did that. I did that on the Tuesday. Yep. Um, because I had some time. And then I spoke to you. We just uh, debriefed it on the Thursday at lunchtime. That's right. Yep. But I, the most important thing with that, and you mentioned it to me, was to prepare that early in the week. And I think 100% that helped from a nerves point of view because I didn't really have to think about that. Once I had those numbers in my head, I knew them all week. So I didn't, like, even the night before the race, I, I knew what my bike power was. I knew roughly what my running pace was. And I well, knew... How come you didn't stick to it? <laughs> Well, I did every one of them other than my running. My running, I got, I got too excited with the crowd as I had to uh, transition and pretty sorry. much ran a 10K PB. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I uh, like essentially that took any stress away to do the race. And then other than the fact of like what I was saying before about just the nerves of wanting to achieve that, I really knew what, what it was going to take. It was just like, could I could I do it kind of thing. Like I'd done it in training, but I knew I hadn't done it a whole lot. And plus I hadn't put it together. So I guess for me, cause I crunched it out in a 12 week period, there was a few anomalies in that. Like actually could I put it all together? And, you know, I'd only done one 90 K time trial and I hadn't done a 90 K and a run off the bike, like of anything near 21. Which we, so isn't, I guess, isn't normal for a Travelo program, just so everyone knows. We would normally do a lot more than that, but <laughs> because of the short yeah, time. <laughs> but I just had a short time frame. So there was the, the, I think those were the things that gave me a little bit of anxiousness. But ultimately, I knew, and Jerry told me this all the way along, like I couldn't have ticked off from a training perspective like it any better. And I knew that in my own mind. Like I, wouldn't, I was just going to give myself every chance by just following the, following the program as close as I could. So ultimately, other than like the nerves of me just wanting to achieve that, I I actually felt really prepared. This is the end of part one of our podcast episode with Nathan Jones. In part two, he talks us through the entire half Ironman debut experience, the highs and lows and the rollercoaster of emotions that come with it. This, the part two gets really raw and quite emotional as Nathan breaks down the mindset he had to use to get through some really tough periods of his professional footy career, as well as using that same mindset to get through the pain and suffering that comes in the back end of the run leg of a half Ironman. Nathan really breaks down how the race unfolded and you'll be surprised to hear the uh, absolute journey he went on to get to the end and how painful it was for him. And most importantly, did he achieve his goals? Did he hit the targets he set out to? He admits he made some mistakes in the race and did that cost him? You'll find out all that and more in his inspiring part two of this story.